come back again. Um, amazing statistics. Um, for those of you that watch and aren't in the class, this won't be anything. So this is just a little bit about the grading, so you can tune out for the next couple of minutes. Uh, we took a midterm, and I think it's important for us all to look at the scores to see where we live in the distribution. That's all that matters. And so a very statistical thing to do. What's the distribution? What does it mean? What does the distribution eventually converge to? So is this just an artifact of this year? Maybe I'm looking for random effects. These sort of things, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about the random effects. So my grades is with it. So that's it. Boom. So you can see where you're at. This is a horrible way of displaying information to you. So you have to stand back and forth and look at things, maybe bubble sports in your head, who knows what to do. So that's not a good way to look at that gap. So we probably need some ways that our human mind. I like this grant. Of course, how we build our histograms depends entirely on the bin size. But I think this gives you at least an idea of where to live in the distribution. So extremely multi -mode. Not surprising for graphs. Happens all the time. Um, some of you, I can tell, don't have a prereq to class A, grad, inference class, I don't care which one, as long as you're taking an inference class. So, know some calculus, know some linear algebra, know some basic and cute. That's okay, times are different now, so having conversations with people and explaining what is a good idea and what is not a good idea, uh, nobody listens to anybody anyway these days, so it wouldn't have mattered. Hopefully, we start to figure out a user advice is useful. Um, there are an astonishing number of very low scores here. These are all perfectly correlated with very little attendance in class. Again, no surprise. I have kept indicators on things. Um, astonishingly correlated with not being in class. I can't actually do, I can't publish that result. Right? Does anybody know why? I'd have to let you know I was going to do that up front. So this is just anecdotal from a statistical perspective. But again, I had a hypothesis before this began, before we even started, and I wrote it down and I told a lot of people about it. And so this confirms my hypothesis. So I'm not just artifact searching. Um, usually, the, this is a little bit more connected, and usually I see one of these over here. Um, it is the lowest low I've ever seen. No surprise. Um, and also something peculiar. Usually on this exam, so I took a composite from other exams, and all their distributions were leaning more to the right. Um, every year, for 13 years before this year, this is year 14, I had seen a 100 on the midterm. So I think we are all kind of falling back just a little bit. That's our community of that impact. Hey, let's talk about this problem. Uh, I just want to point out all that stuff is theory. And so what we do, hanging out with our peers. So I used to, when I used to be more athletic, I never liked to go and perform with people that were worse than me. I always wanted to perform with the guys that would kick my team in regularly because you'd rise for the challenge. And I think we're missing a little bit of that. You know, so our cohort of that. So again, not surprising that some people did very well. And so um, there are a couple residuals or two residuals in this that I don't have great explanation for. But everything else kind of makes sense to me scientifically. Um, the meaning of my distribution across 13 years, not including this, is always in the 80s. It's never fallen below 83. So I want to check all my grade books. So let's just have a look real quick. Grades, 63.25. So the questions that I gave you were questions from people. They're all in my old midterms. It's roughly the same. If you've noticed, we'll go through the midterm in a minute, at least very quickly, every single answer in that midterm has been given in class or in review session. Every single one. So, Kind of interesting. Um, but recorded this year too. So 
I think there's also this negative correlation that the more you give, and the less you just leave up to students, you know, there's this, like you're not motivated. So anyway, I think there's some great stories here as well. Some people are rising ahead and getting stronger, and they see the opportunity. And so this is an opportunity to share. If you haven't thought about it that way, you should just change your perspective. So right now is an opportunity to get ahead of everybody and show how you perform in chaotic situations. It's certainly true, it probably wouldn't be as optimal as in less chaotic situations, but that's not the comparison you should make. The comparison you should make is based off of that and what the future looks like for you, because that's why you're all here. Uh, I'm sure some of you are like, holy smokes, what am I gonna do? I'll give you some concessions and I'll tell you a little bit about the right hand moment. But the mean was 20 points lower. So, in my all time low, I don't believe that that's just by chance. I don't think any of you believe it either. Um, I didn't get 100. My mode is always kind of interesting in these exams. People don't like the modes. In this case, it was 67. It's always like 97 or 100. So it's either you make a little mistake, or there's a bunch of students that do that and mark off one, two, or three points, um, or it's the 100 mark, and there'll be like four or five of those. And when you start making more of the light type mistakes, it's not surprising that those scores go a lot. You know, because you miss a bunch of stuff, there's more variation in the score. Um, so, interesting result, but I think that when people say to you, I think this whole online thing is way better, and maybe there are some benefits, I do believe that there are some benefits. And being able to take classes remotely when you need to is probably a thing. You know, that's probably a good thing. So, if you didn't need to quarantine or you're out on a trip, in a conference, I think we picked up some resources and tools. But I think being here and asking your colleagues for help and working together and doing all this stuff, the reason we bring the university together, it's not just a, well, there was only a little bit of real estate, we all need to cram in here. We need to exchange our ideas. That's why we're at the same place with chemists, engineers, other types of scientists. We need to exchange ideas, that's why we are collectors. So we kind of lost that, it's okay. I think if this is a wake-up call to you, Worth the discussion too. It's an opportunity. I need to get into here. Whatever it takes to get motivated, I'm always born. So it doesn't matter. Um, the mode, the, the median. Median is always in the 80s as well. It usually leans to the right just a little bit. So of the mean is what I've noticed. And so the median, with these grades, 71. So it does lean to the right a little bit again. And that's not that surprising. So I think that that shift, or that discrepancy, is about normal, is what I see. Uh, any other statistics you guys want to see? 95% intervals, probably not so meaningful in this thing. What would that even mean? And so, part Students aren't like you now. So 
your computational abilities are stronger. You expect to compute. I used to get people say, I don't know, take a computing class. It's like, oh, what are you talking about? How is that even possible? Um, that's not possible. So I don't think so. Um, but anyway, so it's not exactly comparable either. So you can make your own conclusions from this, but I told you at least one. So I'm happy to share my opinion. So yeah, that didn't help. And maybe, it's hard to say, maybe there's this weird interaction. Low amount of time and extra anxiety because it was election week, you know, coming up in a couple days. You know, so maybe uh, some people may have had ailing relatives or something like that. So it's hard to say what all the interactions are. And that really says we need more data. You know, we need to do a real time series model. So nothing scientific here, mostly artifactual anecdotes, but I believe that they're true. So from my scientific perspective, I'd say this requires a follow-up study. So I'm really looking forward to in next year how everybody responds to the current situation. Holy smokes, now I'm super motivated. Right now. Okay. Um, any other questions about the scores? I think most of the information is just kind of right here. I think probably what does it all mean, right? So I would say this is about how it's going to turn out. I'm going to grade on a similar grading scheme that I usually grade, but everything is shifted by a letter grade. So I am going to provide you a COVID stimulus package. Whatever grade I normally give you, I'm going to give you an extra letter grade. So you can't get any worse than a B in class. And I never give Fs if you come and you turn your things in. So the worst you can do is what that one means. So a little bit of a safety net. Keep working. There is extra credit. Turn it in if you're having trouble. That 10% midterm extra credit is part of the old homework. You would have had to do something just like it. The only thing you need to do is integrate it into my code and make sure it's by the same syntax so it runs. Useful seal, not very hard. Five minute access of it, probably. So maybe an hour if you can know it. Um, so I would say everybody here with the stimulus, if you've turned in all your stuff, turning in all of your exercises, we also have strong correlation with um, incessant late homeworks turning in. We do make a note. We do give you the full credit at the end of the day. These scores are poor. I understand life is difficult right now. But I would say with the COVID stimulus, those are all A's in the class. All of these students, I'm going to provide you an opportunity. Turn in the midterm perfectly. So take your midterm. I'm not going to give you a new copy. You have a copy of it. If you need a copy of it, get it from Sierra. She has those. Make an appointment with her. Now, she can leave it somewhere for you. If you need it to be left somewhere, we have a for you in front of our offices. And we can leave it for you in the designated spot if you're too worried about coming in. Turn in a completed, corrected exam, and I will give you mercy on your score. But if the exam score, the makeup exam score, is below a 90 on my same grading scheme, the way I've graded it, we won't count it. So we will accept a very minor mistake from you, but it better be close to impeccable. And we will put an indicator into our grade book saying we're going to give you mercy on that. I'll account for it. We will have a final, so keep studying. I'm going to deliver to you roughly five or six questions, and I'm going to give you 24 hours to return those questions to us. You can email them, take a picture, scan them in, Light tech it up, all of that is possible. So whatever you guys need to do, um, do well on that. So there's no great reason not to. Also, it's open book. So you can look in a book. I don't think it's ethical to give you a tape book and turn and say it's a book book. I don't think too many people. Um, let's put it this way. With probability one, somebody will buy it like that. So I don't want to touch you on that. Um, you cannot copy 
each other as answers, and not to show each other answers, but I'll let you be collegial. You certainly cannot ask Sierra anything. You can't <laughs> ask me, I'm just going So, you come to me after you turn it in, I'll talk to you about it. So, lots of opportunities for you to learn this material. Again, the resource here is to learn. And this is showing us that some of us need to put in a little bit of extra. Um, the way we structure this is it doesn't soak up a ton of your time and there's not a lot of physical. So it's stuff that all is going to help you out. I'll give you an extra credit problem. Another one in the future concerns the mind. So I'll um, give you a few more extra credit problems. But any great concerns? I'm sure some of you were like 60s and 80s. <laughs> so it's okay. I think it's all right. Um, Check those mistakes. Some of them are pretty blatant. They're all homework problems. Make sure you know how to do that stuff. If I check again and you guys don't know how to do that, we're going to be less sympathetic. So, is that too much? Did I scold you really hard? I hope. So, everything is meant to be imperfect. So, let's go with that. So, times are hard, but we can rise to the challenge. Some of you have. So, Congratulations to the 293s in the class. That was the high. So that's as good as it got. So I think that, that, that's pretty reasonable. I would estimate that is due to the 50 minute. Right? So that's probably the very good one we saw there. Is a couple of those would have been 100 if got a few more minutes to think about it. Rough estimate. So we won't do the analysis. I think we're going to move on to actually going through the exam just really briefly. I'm not going to go through every answer here, but I want to just say a few things. So since I'm giving you the opportunity to make this up, and if anybody got a 60 and they say, well, I want the chance to make it up too, go ahead. So it will not hurt you. It might even help you. Anybody can make it up if you want to turn in the right solution. That's all very nice. 
It also has another invariant property that if I transform to any other scale, we're really working on the exact same distribution on the inferences are isomorphic to each other. That doesn't mean the mathematical formula is the same. It means that I can transform one to the other. And the information is the same in both distributions. So the answer right here is it's scale invariant. One thing you could say is, well, because it's a scale parameter. So I can just check it too by taking the ratios of the two distributions, multiplying them by a scale parameter, call it C, and see that that parameter cancels out. We've done a whole lot of Some of you did this problem astonishingly well. So I'll assume that that information is buried into a lecture somewhere. And this is not shift invariant. It's not a shift parameter, nor should it be. So if I add a constant to 1 over lambda, and I add a constant to 1 over lambda prime, a different value, a different evaluation of that prior we came up with, uh, what I mean is 1 over lambda minus constant. So if I shift the parameter, 1 over lambda prime shift to a constant ID. The difference between those is not the same thing as 1 over lambda minus 1 over lambda prime. So, no. And it shouldn't be, because it's not even a shift parameter. Why would it be shift invariant? Why would I impose shift invariant? It's not scale parameters. It wouldn't be a property that I would even desire. Anyway, um, I only marked off. I think this was a total of six points. Went right here, and some of you got partial credit. If you answered correctly and had the wrong explanation, you got some credit. This right here, once you do the transformation, so psi right here, I transform everything, lambda is equal to e psi, something like that. All you have to do is a transformation of variables to do all of this. So do the transform. One person did it by the definition, probably soak up an extra 10 minutes to do that. This is the easiest derivative by ever to take. And so if you guys are really quick, you'll notice that 1 over lambda, well, I take lambda, I substitute it for e psi. And then I use the Jacobian term. And that has something to do with each side. And it turns out at the end of the day, the answer to this problem, my Jeffrey's prior for psi, I'll let you do the, the math, is one. It's actually proportional to one. Because it's an improper prior. So one over one over lambda was improper. That's going to be improper too. No surprise. Um, what do you think? You think this thing is shift invariant? I probably should have asked this. This is shift invariant. So on the large scale, scale parameters turn into shift parameters. If you didn't know that. So why do people work on log likelihood scales, things like that? That could be one reason. So you take all your scaling factors and turn them into shift. Um, that makes sense. So it is shifting on that scale. So scale parameter turns to shift the parameters on the whole scale. This was just a matter of recognizing the minus two linear term and the quadratic. This answer I have given to you inadvertently, well maybe not inadvertently, maybe it's totally intentional, but um, the answer that you get is one of your full conditionals in that scale mixture problem, in the Cauchy regression problem. And so usually you see things like this, x transpose x inverse, x transpose y is the typical answer. But you have to remember that my normal is not a scalar times the identity, and you don't get a lot of cancellation in here. The answer for the mean turns out to be this. And there's a similar answer um, for the variance. I'm not going to write down for you, but you would get this out of recognizing first the quadratic term, but then in the minus two linear term. Um, some of you had funny linear algebra right at the end, that you'd get most of it right, and then there were some 
made up rules. So check your linear algebra. So, um, somebody gave me an answer for this that was a function of beta. So some function of beta. I needed to know beta to estimate the expectation of beta. I want you to think about how appalling that is. So if you knew beta, I couldn't need a formula to estimate it. And so this is not ever true. It won't be a function of beta. Beta beta. You're integrating it out. You integrate it over. So expectations are functions of those things over on the right hand side of the bar. Never a function of the thing on the left hand side. You integrate it over there. But anyway, this is the way the case works from. Some of you on the homework didn't do a very Bayesian calculation and then coming up with a normal equation. In that case, the sigma squared is canceled because they were scalars times the identity. And that does work in this problem, but it certainly is a little bit harder to fit everything around. And doing the Bayesian thing is probably the task of calculation. And that's what we were covering in this class. So I would, I would require, I would suggest you look at this sort of canonical form of the normal and figure out what we're doing and why this works. Write um, down the TPF. This is the density function. So a lot of you told me, well, it's normal. It has this mean invariance, like I just said. That's also not the PDF. All I'm checking in that problem is you know what the PDF of the normal is. So there's a bunch of problems in here where I was just checking to see if you knew what the density looked like. And so um, some people might have very subtle mistakes and maybe you just point on that. Um, but some of you didn't know what I was asking. Right? There's, there's a definition theory in here and uh, Recite the density form. Write it all down. Um, so do you know what the normalizing constant looks like? And in this problem, it's kind of important because if you were doing inference on sigma, you need to know what that meaning term is. Several mistakes on problems that you know what that means. Problem three, we've done that for the first week or two of class. So this should have been a check. I was saying some people only like using one data point. And I gave you a whole bunch of so I asked the question, which data point did you use right there? So the math works out seemingly similar. It, it's similar. Um, but at least look at the problem set up. Um, so the post area is some data distribution. You know how to do that. Um, future prediction. Some of you weren't sure what I was asking. A lot of people figured this out. This does end up getting written down in terms of a uh, beta function. Could be a whole bunch of gamma functions. Some of you I marked off one point for this. If you didn't write down the normalizing constants of the beta distribution that you're integrating over here, when you're integrating it against the sampling distribution. And so there is a lot of cancellation that happens in there, which is kind of nice. Um, I didn't mark you off more than a point or two if you didn't write down the normal or divisors. Again, I was just checking to see if you need your distributions. Uh, Relatively simple. If you just wrote it down, the integral form that I would ask you, please take that one more step and say you recognize it as a beta function. But anyway, not too difficult if you knew what was going on. This one requires you to know maybe what the variance of um, the beta looked like. And so, uh, some of you didn't quite get close enough to that, but you have the right idea. You didn't get marked down to any points. You didn't know. But I asked you, know what these things are for distributions like beta and binomials. Any distribution we touch, know the expectation of it. So some of you conceded to me that you don't want it. And I'm checking for it. Anyway, it would have helped. And it will help you in your future. I'm not just doing this to make your life busy. It'll make all these calculations turn into like five minute calculations versus um, very laborious calculations. So just knowing the fundamentals here will help. Problem four. Um, we've done this so many different times. So there are, we did this in the review session, 
framework. We've done it in class. The only thing that I've changed in this is I asked for a key distribution with new degrees of freedom. The answers to this were alpha is equal to mu over 2, beta is equal to mu over 2. That's what it turns out to be. If you have difficulty doing that and showing it, go back to the lecture. See how we did that key distribution. This has popped up in at least a couple of homeworks already. Um, I think the first time you do it, it's kind of a hard calculation. How you got to get the beta of it, you've got to factorize it out. Just turning it into a one doesn't actually help you do this problem. So but these are the answers. You can kind of think through that alpha and beta would have to be the same as each other. So think about what I'm doing. I'm taking a normal distribution that is symmetric. And I'm turning it into another distribution that's symmetric. And the gamma distribution that I'm integrating across has expectation alpha over beta. So on, alpha, on average, I need to not yank that thing around. And so alpha has to be equal to beta to preserve the center of this distribution and keep it symmetric. So that's just a little bit of insight on that. If you can't do this calculation, try to review the lecture and figure out how to do it. It would be helpful. Um, some of you that are exceedingly strong in this part surprised me on this. A couple. So check it out. Um, I already know you guys went through and said, yeah, I feel like I'll lose. So um, find a misconception there. And that's why midterms are made to be useful tools, is they let us know what we don't know. And that's the most important thing to take home from this. Funny answers to these two questions. I think we've said this in class on repeat. But it turns out the degree of freedom here has to be greater than one. Some people wrote equal to one right here. If you did that in both problems, I just marked you off a point. You already know that if nu were one, it would be Cauchy. Cauchy still have to use. If you didn't know that, uh, rewatch all the videos, probably. This one is nu is greater than two. I know some people said like maybe nu is greater or equal to two, thinking that the degree of freedom could only be integer is about what I'm thinking when you did that. Only marked off like a point when you did that. But it turns out those are the It's just another parameter that controls the tail heaviness of the distribution that's different from variance. So picking up those tails. And those distributions that do that and control the tail behavior, not just through the the variant, but they actually change the whole asymptotic behavior of it. Very useful distributions. So, um, in the generalized class, stable distributions sort of theory that you would study, and t distributions, Cauchy distributions fall into that. Um, but the conditions are just those. The degree of freedom. So, didn't have anything to do with what mu was. Some people would say things, well, mu was less than this, then it's important. That doesn't really make any sense. So, because it doesn't matter what you is on that distribution, it's shifting there and all our analysis on things on the view. It's, what it's saying is my inference works the same regardless of what you was in the first place. This was a definition question. This is the question that takes the littlest amount of time. So you will notice that if I chop off the end and tails right here, this is all 95%. And some people did cut down that answer, and you can get 95% in some funny ways. Some people came up with 95% in some bizarre ways, and some people didn't add this thing to 95%. And so I gave varying degrees of wrong that I penalized quite hard on this. Uh, I looked through my old exams on this, and every single year somebody misses this question. And I'm always like, this was the low hanging fruit. So if you miss this, I usually get on the final. So just as I, here's some free points real quick. Um, if you know what an HTTP is. Um, it's certainly not this interval right here. But if you had set this interval right here, I gave you five points out of point. So it's pretty harsh. Again, um, if you want some points back, give me an impeccable example of that. This is really easy. I just use my algorithm. What does highest posterior density mean? Collecting the highest mass first as I slide this thing down. It turns out, and there's a little bit of geometry in this, that if I draw that line through right here, all of these 
these little things intersect where I told you Max was. So there was something to the drawing of this picture and the lines that are going through everything. But really, uh, I told you what this was, what that was, what this was, what this was, what this was. And I would say 80% of you got this right. Um, but that's the issue. It's this stuff. And that all adds to 95%. So check that out. puts you on the Monday of Thanksgiving break. Do you want to make it that Friday before? Uh, they can still email it, I think. Okay. So let's we'll just stick with it. Email. Email to Sierra. Sierra, cut a, cut a note that that email goes to you. Got it. <laughs> so if you need to send it to me, I'll just forward it to Sierra. We're going to sit down and break it together. You know, one Thursday or something like that. Go through them real quickly at the end. If you need the points and you've caught up, you've made up for the deficiencies, um, that's okay. I'll also remind you, incompletes are also an option. I'll be happy to sign any of them if you need it, but why not just make this mess of thing? So it's a better option. So. Quite sympathetic to the situation, the psychology of the situation, the reality of the situation, but I'm also. Um, Impressed by people for taking the, the opportunity to get ahead. That is what, that's all you need to think about. Now is the time. It's the greatest thing that ever could have happened if you take the opportunity. So, variability is something that people that work on Wall Street try to take advantage of. I love crashing markets. So, says Warren Buffett. You understand what you're doing. Money. Variability means a lot of exchange. Okay. Anyway, um, we can all still be successful. Let's get into model selection, um, aka hypothesis testing. Now, that might be a fair statement, it might not be a fair statement, depending on um, how we do our model selection. So, there are techniques, regularizing techniques, that I wouldn't call real hypothesis testing. Um, we'll go into that soon. We're going to be spending a lot of time on that. So let's just set up an example. So just a basic example. This is where we started last time. Example, we want to test. There's some data coming from some model. Don't really care what it is. So I give you a sampling distribution, and I give you a number of data points. Um, when somebody walks in with a bunch of data points and I throw out all of them but one, I better have a really good reason for doing so. So if somebody gives you a bunch of data, you should use it. We don't use it as well. Okay. Um, the null hypothesis. Pretty classical language. What I mean is just old. So, Data is, I'm going to say, we'll do an easy case. Element, well, I'm going to try to make it general. Element of some class right here. Data, H, not. Right so, I drew a 
it's your last time in the 87 region. Um, let's do it. the alternative hypothesis. I'll call it H1, some people call it HA or H alpha. Some people call this H0, some people call it H0. Doesn't matter, it's just language. So this is really our versus. So in typical hypothesis testing, they want to know if theta is in some region versus um, some other region. We'll call this H1. And I'll define this as the complement of H0. The other stuff. Mohammed asks some questions. He's like, well, there would be some really unfair things to compare to each other, like one point versus an entire spectrum. So let's just entertain this momentarily. We need to do it all mathematically, but people do ask this seemingly ridiculous question. So if this was one point, then this would be, if this, let's just say this was the, on the real number line. This was one point, and this was everything but that point. I think if somebody came to me and that was a real question, I'd say probably <laughs> the sea of stuff. And if I were wrong, I would be <laughs> unquantifiably close to the right thing. So, because I can remove one point from the real number line, and essentially I've got the same thing. Go talk to a mathematician if you don't feel that way. Um, saying that, we're giving great importance to that one point, so maybe we don't want to be so cavalier to our scientist friends that come to us and say, it's not that. And it, it's kind of like that. It's not that. So that's how I really feel about this, if this were one point. It's, it's the other one. Um, let's just think about it as maybe conditions that we're comparing to each other. And I think that that is an absolutely decent question. We will talk about the point null thing. I think it's the most contentious question that we ask for the last hundred years that we continue to keep asking. I'll tell you what Bayesians do with it. I'll tell you what classicists do with it. Or name and Pearsonians do with it. But we'll study most of the Bayesian thing. I think the way the Bayesian tries to tackle it makes sense, but it's a hard question to answer. But in general, most Bayesians use what's called the base factor. There are other contractions. The base factor is a factor that compares the two models. This thing compares H naught to H1. And it compares it in a ratio sense. So it's the integral of the likelihood function. I goes from 1 to n. F X I given theta where the thetas that I'm going to operate on live in the null space. And then I've got some continuous prior distribution. It's built just on the null space. So it's supported on this space right here. And then I integrate over the theta. And I do the same thing to the alternative. Uh, it goes from 1 to n, f, x i, given theta. So the same integrated expression, except for the, all, the riders are different on the spaces. Theta. We're only integrating over the alternative space. And I'm going to point out real quickly, these probably have to be proper in those cases. In some cases, they don't, but I just want to point out you don't give it any thought and you use an improper primer, assume your analysis means nothing. We'll go into this point. Kind of kick everything off. Maybe at this point. Um, but this is what it is. And so what I would really do, what I would really say this whole thing is, if I were to interpret it, is I would say um, the average, this is the average model fit. In H naught, the 
divided by the average model fit in each one. Where's the averaging? I'm averaging over this. So I'm looking at this model that's constricted to each knot. And I'm averaging out the thetas. So on average, I'm saying how well those xi's fit theta knot. I'm averaging over a whole bunch of different possibilities. So I'm averaging all over all thetas that live in theta knot. And then I'm looking at this average right here as well. So you'll note that this is the margin of x, that's my data right here, on each knot compared to the margin on each one of all of my data. So my data is just x1 to x0. So these are just the marginal distributions. So if you don't like me using the word margin, you just use the word the letter f right here. So I'm just marginalizing out theta and averaging it out. It's that, it's what it is. So they're just marginal calculations. These are usually the denominators of our posterior distribution. And they are an integral that needs to be done. And quite possibly, um, the normalizing constants in this will matter. So the normalizing constants for these two prior distributions, if they're measuring something that doesn't exactly overlap and appear in the model, like in the point null case, is a really good example of this. Um, the normalizing constants here don't necessarily need to be the same. So this calculation is the calculation that you need to do to figure out what a phase factor is. It's an extraordinarily difficult calculation. It's more difficult than doing a posterior inference. Um, I think most of the question is how do we average when we do all of this. Uh, I'm going to come back next time and I'm going to compare everything to the maximum or the likelihood ratio. So I'll say we'll compare next time. the uh, max likelihood ratio. And there's a lot of people that use this. And it's very similar to the ratio of two things, but instead of averaging over it, we maximize those two things. And I think that's a good point for us to just kick everything off. Turns out all key values consider that thing, max likelihood ratio. And many um, likelihood ratio, or I'll say model selectors use it through the deviance function. So the difference in log likelihoods, max log likelihoods. So if you've ever seen that before, a lot of people will use that function as well. A lot of people will penalize that function. So AIC, BIC penalizes that, DIC penalizes that. So all these information criteria that people use rely on this right here. So hopefully you're familiar with this. If you've ever seen anything made in the Kirsovian and you've been in grad class, you certainly familiarize yourself with this. This is not that big. It's just averaging. So Bayesians tend to be good on average because all our analyses are based on averages. Anyway, let's pick up there. Um, we won't make this purely philosophical. We'll get into the computation of how you actually do this calculation and how you do that's the more interesting thing. Okay, guys. So I'll see you next time. Thanks for your patience as I explain the exam. Hopefully,